All right, welcome back to biology. My name is Mr. Kowalski. Uh, welcome back to Unit 4. We've been talking about cell transport. In the first section, we talked about the cell membrane, the parts of the cell membrane, and the proteins embedded in it. In the second unit, we talked about passive transport, when, it's, when molecules go from high to low concentration, okay, without needing energy to move them, like diffusion and osmosis. They just happen naturally, okay? Today, we're going to talk about active transport, or when we actually have to use energy to move materials across a cell membrane, okay? Now, I'm gonna be drawing some things up here on the board, okay, but your PowerPoint slides are actually gonna have some pretty cool animations and some GIFs uh, that you can actually use to your benefit, okay? So, let's talk about active transport. Active transport, okay, we're moving molecules instead of high to low, like in passive, like if this were passive transport, I have more of the purple dots on the left side than I do on my right, so passive would wanna move this direction, high to low, without the use of energy. But active transport, we're going to go in the opposite direction, okay? We're actually going to push the uh, molecules from low concentration, where there's not a lot of them, to high concentration, where there are a lot of them, okay? Where they don't want to be. Now, this doesn't happen naturally, so what we have to do is we have to use one of two things. The first option is we could use a pump, okay? Something like this blue guy here, okay? Now you'll notice one end is closed. Okay, the other end is open. That's because if I just had this open the whole way, the purple dots would go flooding back across because that would be passive transport. That's the way they want to go. But if I control the flow and I use energy to change the shape of my proteins, okay, to allow these little purple dots to actually push their way across, okay, and when they get to a certain point, I would use energy to change the shape now of my, of my blue protein so that I can actually move the purple dot where it needs to go. Okay, I would change the shape, move my little purple dot, and that would allow it to move across. Okay, so it's think of it like a, a door, maybe an automatic door that closes behind you to keep the cold out at like the grocery store or something. It's the same idea. Okay, we use energy to change its shape to move from low to high concentration. Again, if it was open all the time, things would just flood back across. So that is active transport. We're using energy to go from high to low. In this case, we use pumps, but there's another way we can do active transport, and if you'll walk with me, okay? It's known as bulk transport, okay? And that's when we actually use the cell, and we change the shape of the cell in order to move materials. Okay, let me show you what I mean. I've got my cell here, okay? Now, let me zoom in actually a little bit, bring it a little bit closer so you can see it, okay? I've got my cell, and he wants this green dot. He wants it bad. He needs to eat that guy to give him some energy. He's going to break it down with his lysosomes, okay? Well, how's he going to do it? He doesn't have hands. He can't just reach out and get it. Okay, so what he'll do is he'll actually surround that green dot okay, with his cell membrane. Okay, until he gets to a point where he is actually touching his own cell membrane on the opposite side. And I still my green dot on the inside. Well, now, how do I isolate this green dot and get him into the cell membrane where he still can't get out? Well, once the cell membrane touches on either side, they just recombine, and now I have a cell with a vesicle inside it containing whatever I want to eat. Okay, so I've brought this green dot into my cell. So this is known as endocytosis. Okay. So this is known as endocytosis, when I bring materials into the cell. There's two types of endocytosis. The first one is known as phagocytosis, which is what this is because I'm taking in a material. Maybe this is a cell, uh, maybe it's some type of food particle, something that my cell wants to bring in that's a large material. Okay? If this were large amounts of liquid, okay, let's say if I change the green dot, and let's say that it was just like a large amount of liquid. I don't know what color to use orange here. Let's say it's orange soda, okay? <laughs> and I'll just make it like a little wavy thing. Okay? He just wants large amounts of orange soda inside of him. Well, that's known as pinocytosis, okay? So phagocytosis and pinocytosis are both types of endocytosis. The opposite then, when I want to push something out of the cell, like think back to when we talked about uh, protein synthesis uh, in the cells and how the Golgi apparatus would package the protein and then take it to the cell membrane and then that vesicle would actually become a part of the cell membrane. That's known as exocytosis, okay? So if I take this and let me move this guy out of the way. I've got my vesicle containing a protein, okay? If I move that vesicle close, okay, to the cell membrane, what will actually happen is 
that once it gets to this point and it's pushed all the way up against the side of the cell membrane, the cell membrane will just open up. My cell is still closed off from its environment, but now I have an opening for my green dot to actually leave the cell and go on and be used somewhere else. Okay? So since it's exiting the cell, this is known as exocytosis. So endo we bring in, exo we bring out. There's two types of endo, phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Okay? Now, how do we do these processes? We've been calling these active transport, but exactly how is it done? Well, we need some type of energy to actually move these materials, and that energy in our cells is known as adenosine triphosphate, or as it's sometimes called ATP. Okay? Adenosine triphosphate. Okay? Adenosine is for this stuff over here. We'll talk more about it when we talk about the next unit. Okay? But just know that all this over here is the adenosine. That's where that comes from. Over here, I have three P's, okay? And actually, I need to fix this. There we go. I have three P's all bonded together. This is where the triphosphate comes from. Triphosphate, three phosphates. There you go, okay? Now, we learned back in Unit 2 when we talked about biochemistry that energy in your cells or in your body is stored in bonds between atoms or bonds between molecules. So in this case, we have a high-energy bond between the second and third phosphate of ATP, okay? So when I take ATP and I actually break it, when I break this bond between the second and third phosphate, I get something called ADP for adenosine diphosphate. I get an extra free phosphate, and I'll circle that guy because he's all by himself. But I also get large amounts of what? Energy released. Okay? So when I break that bond, I get large amounts of energy. Now, the nice thing about ATP and ADP is that it's recyclable. Your cells actually don't have a lot of ATP inside them, okay? And what they do instead is they just recycle it. And let me show you how they do that, okay? Let me grab a different color marker here, okay? So I went from ATP to ADP and a free phosphate. When I did that, I released energy, okay? Now, if I take that ADP, I recombine it with that free phosphate, and I add energy for storage. Okay. If I add that, that phosphate back on for energy storage, then it becomes ATP again. Okay, So because I had the two phosphates, I add the third phosphate back to it. Now I've stored that energy again. So I can just keep going through this cycle constantly. Okay, I can just keep going back and forth. Okay, ATP to ADP to free phosphate, and then put it back together by storing energy. So this process occurs all the time over and over and over again, okay? And this is uh, the energy that you bring into your body, uh, the food energy that you use, is broken down during your cellular respiration, and that's where we make ATP, which we'll talk about more uh, later on in the year, okay? But let's talk about one of the things that we use this ATP for, okay? How am I doing on time? Oh, okay, I'm good. Okay, I use ATP, you use ATP, we all use ATP for something called the sodium potassium pump. Now the sodium potassium pump is one of the major pumps of your cells, okay? It uses the majority of the energy that you bring into your body on a daily basis, okay? And let me show you how it works and what it's used for, okay? Now you'll notice I've got a pump and it's closed on one end, just like the one on the other side of the room that I showed you a second ago. It's closed on one end. That's because I want to move sodium from inside the cell to outside the cell. But if you'll notice, where do I have more sodiums to begin with? Well, I have more on the outside to begin with. Okay. I have more sodiums out here on the outside to begin with. So naturally, they would want to move in this direction, but that's not what I want to have happen. I want to put more sodiums on the outside of the cell. So I use this pump called the sodium potassium pump. What I need is I need three phosphates, and excuse me, <laughs> three sodiums, and they're going to fit into these spaces right here. And you can kind of see I already have them and they fit perfectly, almost like puzzle pieces on this side. But my protein is closed on one end. How am I going to get it to change shape so I can open up and let these sodiums free? Well, I have to add energy and a phosphate. So you'll notice I have my ATP molecule here. When one of his little phosphates snaps off, gives energy, and attaches to the protein, you'll notice that it's actually touching it now, the protein will change shape, and it'll flip around so that the opening now is on the opposite end. The 
The opening now is pointing downwards. So now my sodiums can leave the pump. They join their buddies. Okay, my sodiums can leave. And now I have an opening that my potassiums that are down here can enter. Notice they fit here into these little triangles, okay? So I get two potassiums to fit into the triangles, okay? Now up here at the top, I still have my phosphate attached, okay? Which is keeping it open at the bottom. Now what if I wanted it to go from open at the bottom to now open at the top again? Well, all I need to do is take away that phosphate. When I take that phosphate away, now we go back to our original shape and our opening towards the inside. We'll take more sodiums in. We'll add another ATP, which becomes ADP. Let me change it here. One, two. Remember, because I only have two phosphates. The third one's attached to the protein. So now I change shape. I let the sodiums out. Potassiums come in. Phosphate leaves. And I go back. Okay? And this just keeps repeating over and over and over again, sort of like it is on the bottom of your screen. There. Okay? So this is the sodium-potassium pump. So again, four major topics of active transport, but they all have to do with each other, okay? We talked about active, meaning we're going from low to high. There's two ways you could do it. You could use a pump, like the sodium potassium pump here behind me, or you could do it using, uh, let me go back down here to the end, okay? Bulk transport, where we're moving things into or out of the cell. That requires lots of energy too. And then our energy source is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which can be recycled. So you can kind of see how this all kind of ties together, fits together, okay? Now, hopefully you learned something. Let me back this up so you can see the whole thing. Okay, if you have questions, please contact me. Uh, I'm at Coach Kabuski on Twitter, or you can contact me at jkubuske at gocathedral.com. That's jkubuske at gocathedral.com. Please feel free to visit the website. Hopefully you're there now. That's why you would have seen this. Okay, and then follow me on YouTube as well. Okay, if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, good luck studying.